Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, Reverend Delianne Gray Donis Coops. She'll be with us today. Welcome. Thank you. Please stand for the call for worship. We have been walking, Lord, on roads of uncertainty and fear, on roads of exhaustion and doubt, on winding roads that have led us here. Join us on our journey, Lord. By your presence, refresh our spirits, set our hearts ablaze, and give us new direction. Let us worship God.
When we say we don't sin, we deny who we are. But when we say there's no way out, we deny who God is. Trusting that God's grace is more powerful than our sin, let us confess our sins together. Jesus, teacher, we confess today outright foolishness. We have been foolish to doubt your promises, foolish to withhold love from neighbor, foolish to chase riches, prestige, and power, foolish to waste your gifts and spoil your creation, foolish to divide your children from each other, foolish to think hope is lost. Wise us up again. Open our hearts to your presence in our lives, in our neighbors, in our world. In your grace, help us grab onto our millionth second chance and forge a new road from here on. Hear the good news. New life is not only possible, it has drawn near to us in Jesus. The promises for us and for all the children of God. By the grace of God, the glory of Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit, we are forgiven and we are free. Alleluia. Amen. Please stand. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, send your fire to dance across these familiar words, illuminating ancient stories, illuminating weary hearts. Set us ablaze again with the promises of the Holy Word. Still proclaimed for us, amen. Today's Acts of Apostle comes from the book of Acts 2, 14a and 36 through 41. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you cross, crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? 
Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you, for your children, and for all of who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him, and he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Today's epistle lesson comes from 1 Peter 1, verses 17 through 23. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but it was revealed at the end of the ages of your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. The word of the Lord.
You may be seated. Well, good morning to all of you this morning. Thank you, choir, magnificent choir, organ, beloved congregation. God is here and gives us his grace and peace to bless us in worship this morning. It's good to be back here. I was here uh, last summer several times, you, some of you may remember, and uh, got to know some of you, um, and I looked forward to coming back uh, this Sunday, and I will be here next Sunday too. Thank you for inviting me to bring a word from the Lord to you. So on this Sunday morning, some of you probably remember that Easter was just a couple weeks ago, and yet we're beginning the third week of Easter Tide. We have the, the beautiful orchids here reminding us of Easter, but somehow we human beings very quickly forget, and the glory of Easter and the high point of Easter starts fading in our memories into the past. So with our gospel reading today, I hope that we can hold on to uh, just the extraordinary, astonishing thing that Easter was when Jesus rose from the dead. And we are going to do that by reading the story out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, and beginning at verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and t talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their com companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bed, bread. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Christ. Let us, pr let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your living word and for this precious, marvelous story of our Lord walking the road to Emmaus with these followers. Lord, may we have open hearts to receive what you would have us uh, receive today, and may we respond to it in a way that our, sh our lives show that they are transformed by this word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So <clears throat> in this story, Cleopas and his unnamed companion, and I like to think of her as Mrs. Cleopas, uh, on the road to Emmaus, which was a village just outside of Jerusalem, about seven miles. There's a few different accounts, but basically seven miles out of Jerusalem. It's a long hike. And as they begin their journey, a stranger comes up to them. They do not recognize him, as the text says. Perhaps, I was imagining this, perhaps it was getting dark, dusk. Perhaps it was the clothes he was wearing. Or perhaps, when we think of our 21st century, he was wearing a pandemic mask. But at any rate, they did not, they were kept from recognizing who this was. The text says they were kept from recognizing him or he was hidden from them. And Jesus comes up to them and asks them, okay, what are you discussing? What are you so deeply uh, conversing about? <clears throat> you can imagine they're surprised when he comes up and asks this question. Where has this guy been? Hasn't he been around here over the weekend and knows what has happened over the weekend? The crucifixion of Jesus? They are very sad and incredulous. And they reply with their own question. Are you the only one around Jerusalem who doesn't know what has happened here? They tell the stranger that a certain Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet, mighty in deed and in word, was condemned to death by the chief priests and the leaders. We had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel, they say. Their hopes had been dashed once again. You see, the first century Jews were always hoping for their Messiah. They were living under an oppressive Roman government. Most of them were poor and were rural workers or barely eking out a living, and they were living under back-breaking taxes to the government. They were looking for a charismatic leader who would deliver them from this, the oppressive Romans and restore their land to them bring them out of their exile and give them their land back and their power and influence. And at that time, we lose track of this, but there were probably periodically would-be messiahs or false messiahs. In fact, if you start reading about that time in history, there's one named Judas Maccabeus, and uh, that was a, a person who led the Maccabean revolt. There was another man named Bar Kokhba, also claimed to be a messiah. And he said he would crush the Romans and restore Israel. But the Jews did not get the message of Jesus when Jesus came on the scene. That he would be a different kind of messiah. He would not be a violent messiah. He would not crush the Romans through violence, but he was one who would bring transformation to Israel and be king for sure, except not the kind of king they expected. In fact, he had entered Jerusalem not on a high and mighty horse, but on a lowly donkey. Even after the resurrection, we read that some of the disciples and followers who were with Jesus are still clueless. Knuckleheads is what pastor and author Will Williman calls some of these disciples. Knuckleheads! They still don't get it after all this time with Jesus. And they still ask him, Lord, 
Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Their idea of restoration, which be, would be a high and mighty king with all the show and pomp that goes with it. So when the stranger came alongside of the, the uh, travelers, these two were in deep grief and, and disappointment because of dashed hopes. The glorious victory that they had hoped for had not happened, and as far as they knew, their Messiah had died. When Jesus joined them, they, they, they didn't see him. Luke writes that when the stranger joins, he notices their long faces. And they explain to him what had happened. Cleo, Cleopas also adds to the report this information that there were two women at the tomb on the third day, that is that morning, the morning of that day. And the women had discovered an empty tomb, but they had seen a vision. And the angel had said, he is not here, but he is risen. And the women rush back to Jerusalem to report this. The travelers, still unrecognized, the traveler who joined them, who had joined Cleopas and his companion, finally responds with, I think, a bit of gentle scolding. Oh, how foolish you are and slow of heart to believe. Then this stranger, who we know, of course, is Jesus, begins to explain the scripture. And he starts with the prophets, probably with Genesis and the prophets, the Torah, and he explains all the prophecies and the signs that point to the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. I wish I had been there, don't you? I have a lot of questions yet, and especially when we think of the Old Testament, and that's all they had at that time, there are some sections there I have a lot of questions about. And here was Jesus explaining this all to them. The gospel writer Luke tells us it was getting late and they neared the village of Emmaus. And they were so intensely in conversation that, the, that there was something about this, this stranger and their hearts were, were just moved. Uh, the, the text says burning. So they invited, they didn't want to part. They said, please come in, stay with us. And then when they were at table, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And of course, the scales fell off their eyes. They saw, they had seen Jesus do this before, and they could see that this was the Lord himself who was presiding over communion. They had invited him as a guest, and he became the host of this meal, as he is at every communion table. And through the ages since the resurrection of Jesus, we too celebrate the Lord's Supper, we call it, or the Eucharist, or the communion, remembering the death and looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. What is so amazing and wonderful is that the spirit of the living Christ is with us even today as we celebrate communion. In fact, one commentator made this point, and I thought it was significant, that this story of Jesus celebrating with these first century Christians, Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas and others, of course, before we, we've read about the disciples also sharing the Last Supper with him, but having that recorded makes us first-hand witnesses. It's like testimony. And every time we celebrate communion, communion, it's as if we have a front row seat at this big event because we are united with those believers who saw Jesus. And because of the living spirit of Christ, when we celebrate communion, we have the living presence of Christ again. We share that with them. When Jesus blesses the bread and gives it to them, their eyes were opened. They saw Jesus and they received Jesus with joy. And of course, the text tells us that Jesus vanishes from their midst. But in their joy and excitement, they run back to Jerusalem. 
And I think Luke here has a twinkle of humor in his eye, like, oh my goodness, you know, it's, it's dark, but these people are so excited. Let's just go back along this trail as fast as we can. We have to join the other disciples. And they rush back in that same hour, says Luke. So they had just done the seven miles. They rush back with uh, the good news that the Lord has risen. The Lord has risen indeed. And, and the disciples chorus back. Yes, the Lord has risen and he, he's appeared to Simon. They saw Jesus in the flesh and body as recorded in the next verses when, when Jesus appears in their midst when they're all together he says look at my hands look at my feet and then to prove that he was for real Jesus asked for something to eat we have the testimony of not only Cleopas but also all of the other disciples and then at the beginning of Acts uh, as is recorded, that Jesus had appeared to at least 500 other people in his risen body. For all of us sitting here this morning at Lakeside who have celebrated this Easter, this world-changing historic event, how do we really see this risen Christ today? Do we recognize him when we see him? Christians around the world believe that the living Christ is in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And when we celebrate communion, as I said, we have the presence of the living Christ. We believe that and we share that with those first century participants in the Lord's Supper. And the Apostle Paul claims that those who have died with Christ will also rise in, with him in Romans 6 verse 8. If we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. But what does this mean for us here today? Well, followers of Jesus regard this as first-hand testimony. Cleopas reported it to the disciples and Luke wrote the report in the gospel and we read it here this morning. In the Gospel of John, <clears throat> the risen Lord says to doubting Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Blessed are those who have not seen yet have come to believe. We're among those people, right? We sitting here, this morning in the 21st century are among those who have not seen Jesus in the flesh and can only imagine meeting Jesus. And today our epistle reading that Bill read uh, from P First Peter explains that even though we're not among the privileged to see Jesus in the flesh, the resurrection of Jesus does affect us in life-changing ways. Two things happen from, being, from our lives being redeemed by the death of Jesus. One is that Peter says, faith or trust in God that grows. And the other, he says, is a mutual love, loving one another deeply from the heart. This is what he says. Through Jesus, you have come to trust in God. <clears throat> faith, I believe, is not just intellectual assent. I think a better word to describe faith is trust in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your trust, that is your faith and hope, are in God. And then verse 22 that follows. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth so that you have genuine mutual affection, love one another deeply from the heart. So the two important signs of this resurrection transformation, Peter says, is this trust in God and a deep mutual affection that knits us together as the body of Christ. And I believe a mutual love, uh, a love for others who are different from us. That's the only way we can spread the love of Jesus Christ. Trusting God, that's important. I think it's harder 
yet to love one another deeply from the heart. I know I've had to do, do some deep soul searching about that. I think especially in the last years where there are so many Christians who follow the same Jesus but have such different opposite opinions on everything from all the social issues, abortion, gender identity, all the way to war or peace or capital punishment. How can we love people who have such opposite of opinions from ours so that it even makes our stomachs turn when we hear it? It's, it's challenging. And yet Peter calls us to love one another deeply and not just within the church. I believe that this really extends to the people whom we meet in our daily work, our lives, our walks. Notice that Cleopas and the disciples run in joy and excitement to tell other disciples. Jesus promises that soon, in 40 days, they will, he will give them power, the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, to tell everyone, including non-Jews, including Gentiles, most of us, that they have seen the living Jesus. That's the glorious of Pentecost. And Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas recognized who Jesus was, and their lives were totally changed. When we really see who Jesus uh, is, I don't, know, I don't know how we cannot be changed. We will be changed. And believe me, I, I think that as I live my life and I'm, I get older, I see that it's a long process. And sort of inch by inch, walk by walk, block by block, whatever, however you want to measure in life, we are in the process of being changed into the likeness of Christ. But it takes a lot, a lot of time. It takes a constant um, dependence on the Holy Spirit to do that transformation in our hearts. But it happens. Seeing Jesus is remembering Jesus who died and rose from the dead, not only for us, but for the world. We celebrate that in the breaking of bread. Seeing Jesus means we also trust God for the future. And I know for many of us, not only personally, but as a church, as a body of believers, and we have people we're related to in our family, where the future is uncertain. But we have to go on with the certainty and the assurance that God, we are God's beloved, that God knows our future and is planning our future and is planning the future of the ones we love for, the, for the, our best and for their best. We have to have that trust, that strong faith, no matter how uncertain things seem at the moment. We are not in control. It's the God, the creator of the world, the one who sent his son into the world for us who is in charge. And see, seeing Jesus means, so it's remembering Jesus, his death and resurrection, also trusting God for the future, and thirdly, being transformed by love. Not only love for God, but love for one another. And I, I sense that you are practicing this, and you will have to keep practicing it for a long time. Your shepherd, the shepherd of the flock, Pastor Chris, has, has now left for other things, and more than ever, you need each other. And more than ever, you need to, to get reinforcements and to invite that friend you've been thinking about or that neighbor or that person you've been praying for. Seeing Jesus means be, becoming transformed by love, not only for love for God, but love for one another and for that neighbor who needs help. 
The more we see Jesus, the more our lives are transformed in the way of Jesus. Will you, going forward, trust God and follow the way of Jesus? Will you, going forward, love one another deeply as we travel that road from the empty tomb to a resurrection future? Will you? May it be so, God helping us and the Holy Spirit of the living Christ with us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you are an all-powerful, sovereign God, that you know all things, that your love is limitless, that your Holy Spirit is present with us. You did not leave us as orphans, but you have given us your spirit, the very presence of the living Christ. So we go forward in trust, faith, and also in love, knowing that we have to practice this. Even when we don't feel the love, we have to practice the love because it comes through Jesus. We pray this and we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you will um, be with us, and I pray especially that you will be with this beloved congregation of yours here at Lakeside. Help us to listen to you and your direction. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let us affirm our faith together. Let us say what we believe. In life and death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit, 
We trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good, acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation, and makes us heirs with the Christ of the covenant. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus, Christ, Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, was crucified and raised from the dead, delivering us from the death to life eternal. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and the renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all the believers in one body of Christ, the church. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives. Even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, come, Lord Jesus. Please be seated. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray in ever widening circles extending the love we feel for those closest to us out into our communities, our nation, and our world. Through our prayers, stretch us to make a place in our hearts for those who we do not know, but who are known by you. We pray for those we know best, friends, families, neighbors, coworkers, all whose joys and troubles affect us daily. Today we especially pray for Charlie, for Eugene, for Beverly, for Chuck, for Brian. We pray for Lakeside Presbyterian Church. We pray for our session who meets this afternoon to discern the future of this church. And we pray for the person or people who are just waiting to be connected. We pray for those we see but do not know, those who cross our paths on the road or the grocery store or the restaurant, those who are our neighbors here in San Francisco or around the Bay Area, but whose inner lives remain a mystery to us. We ask that your spirit dwell in our community, turning strangers into neighbors, giving people purpose and compassion. Help us to see past polite fictions to those who are hungry, scared or lonely, and in seeing them, love them. We pray for those we see only in the media, siblings around the world whose stories get sold to us as the news of the day. Help us to see humanity behind the pixels and sound bites. We pray especially for those caught in cycles of violence and war, oppression and economic scarcity, persecution because of their religion, ethnicity or gender, all those who do not know what it is to be valued and cherished. Help us to feel the ties that bind all your children together to love as radically as you do. We pray for those we do not see, the millions whose stories go untold, whose lives feel so far removed from our own. We pray for your people in every place and ask that you keep, that you keep reminding us that no one is beyond your reach. Keep us every, ever hungry to know your people, not as curiosities, but as siblings in Christ. Expand our hearts, O God, until we can hold your people inside them, all your people, 
all over the world, following the example of our Lord Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another and especially our guests. We'll get better at that as time goes by. <laughs> uh, exactly. We'll practice our passing of the peace next week. A few announcements this morning in, the, in our life of our church. First of all, you, I want to thank the Reverend Delian Coops for bringing a message to us this morning and to allowing us to worship God. Your words were, have touched my heart and I know so many others. So thank you so very much. As she acknowledged our orchids at the beginning of her sermon, it reminds me that our orchids need homes. So if you donated an orchid for our Easter service, our Easter season, please make sure you take it home this week. We will begin to dwindle them down. And as we know, we tend to make changes up here as life moves forward. So that is in the process. So if you haven't done so, please take those home. Continuing our 10 o'clock Thursday tradition, we've been having Bible study for years. But beginning this Thursday, we're going to have trivia, coffee, and pastries at 10 o'clock in the fireside room. So for those of you who've been coming to Bible study, please keep coming for trivia. If you have not joined us on Thursday mornings at 10 o'clock, you are encouraged to do so this week. And also, if you have not picked up your quarterly statement, they are in the Northex after church, so please do so um, at, the end, at the conclusion of our worship service. Today's also the day we celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. So you have a birthday or anniversary in the month of April. Would you please stand? Oh, I'm already standing, but go st remain standing. Let me give us all a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward to collect the morning offering. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God.
So receive, as you leave this place, receive God's blessing. No, go forth to love and serve the Lord and know that the risen Christ walks with each one of us on our journey. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.